Walking to the gym with my best girl, Melissa, I thought I'd say a few words about a conversation I had last night. I hate having my collar done up like this. I think it looks ridiculous on camera. But if I unzip it, I'm afraid the collar is going to click with the mic. It, I think it's going to make a, you know, you see a clicky click thing. Anyway, um, uh, I don't want to look like I'm more a priest in a cassock, you know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, uh, last night I was talking to TCAT. So you heard that conversation start, and then you drifted off to sleep. And a large part of what we talked about was the nature of human intelligence and the IQ test. Mm. And that gets a little bit meaning of lifey, as you know. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really important, those conversations, to be honest with yourself and others about why you're raising the question in the first place. So you probably don't hear this as much as I do, Melissa, just because you're female. But there's a lot of, of male angst about IQ tests and objective measures of intelligence on the internet. And a lot of it, it's kind of like roughly parallel to left-wingers who blame capitalism for all their failings in life. Like uh, left-wingers who feel they should have had a better life, they had tremendous potential, they should have accomplished more, but you know, the system was against them. Yeah. That, that capitalism as a system is, is keeping them down. Mm -hmm. Now, and of course, you have to sympathize to some extent you know, I'm not assuming there are crazy conspiracy theorists in all cases. There may be some truth to that. They may not have been able to afford university tuition, and they may blame the capitalist system for that. But there's a lot of kind of generalized anxiety about IQ tests and uh, verifiable, objectively real intelligence on the Internet, and people presenting theories one way or another about it, whether the focus is on heredity, on uh, genetics and IQ, or if it's about other ways of kind of taking the concept of palpable, materially real, verifiable intelligence and basically kind of weaponizing it into a political science, social science uh, concept used in our debates. Well, debates even about democracy. Who should make decisions in society? Um, I, I guess today a lot of people must feel it's a grave injustice that someone as stupid as Donald Trump <laughs> has so much power in a sense. And we've really seen how stupid Donald Trump is in the last year or so. Yeah, I've been reflecting on that lately, yeah. too, because I'm reading about Mao Zedong, and it's like... Holy, holy shit! Like, holy you know, how shit! Like, how many leaders in the past have had low IQ? And just... that, let, let, let's sit while we finish. Let's, let's walk through the park and sit in the back. No, but that, I didn't even think of that example. That's so obvious. But, you know, it's, it's really true. And, I mean, w w like, again, so, again, how are you even going to measure intelligence in Mao Zedong's case? But I mentioned to Melissa the other day, it's, it's indicative that Joseph Stalin considered Mao Zedong stupid and crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, if someone else who's a completely insane dictator considers you kind of stupid and crazy. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Mao Zedong, one of the ways he came up in politics was through his poetry. And you've got to talk to Chinese people who really know poetry. But, you know, when you do, they're like, poetry is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, no, 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 no. There were warning signs here. Um, some of his poetry is, is megalomaniacal. I've read that. I've looked at his, his poetry. But also, apparently, just his... Uh, I guess I think we should probably do that bench. I think we'll be okay. I think it's not too sunny, no? Uh, but apparently, also, to some extent, when people are doing classical literary Chinese poetry, which it is, it's classical in form, uh, you can tell he's just, he's just not too bright. <laughs> so, uh, but you've got to talk to people who really know Chinese poetry to get that get that out of them. So anyway, we, a lot of us struggle with, culturally or politically, some sense of questioning about, about what is intelligence, how is it measured, and then once you have a measurement, like IQ, in what ways does it matter? So, you know, spontaneously, in talking about this with TCAT last night, one of the first things I said to him in challenging his assumptions about the IQ test was to ask him, um, do you think there's any relationship between IQ and whether or not someone can paint a great painting. Now, it was a new thought for him, and TCAT is definitely someone who's smart enough to understand right away that I don't mean this as a holotype. I don't mean this as one unique example. Um, you know, the relationship between intelligence and painting, likewise, there's a question, what do you think there's a, diff there's a relationship between this IQ test and any other form of technically convoluted skill, uh, whether that's driving or, uh, 
I, you, any, performing surgery as a medical doctor or anything else, what, you know, why, why do you think, uh, or, or do you think, you know, IQ would relate to these things in any, in any sense at all? And of course, really, after a moment's reflection, the answer is no. So my position on the IQ test is that um, the IQ test tells you one thing and one thing only. Shout out to the seagulls. Seagull, <laughs> guest, guest star in my video. I'm going to give him half the AdSense revenue. I make about 15 cents out of these videos, just so you know. Um, anyway, uh, I think that IQ, the IQ test represents one thing and one thing only. And that is that it tells you how well a human being can write the IQ test. Now, in the same way, I don't think this is an unreasonable degree of skepticism. If you looked at something like a driver's test, I think a driving test shows you how well you can write the driving test or perform the driving test. So there's a written component and an actual direct driving component. But I think all of us know, even if I've never driven a car in my life, I'm aware that there's a gap between the real world of driving, actual emergency driving conditions, and what you encounter, what you're tested on in a driving test. Um, in Taiwan, I mentioned it's especially surreal. Several people remarked on this to me, that the form of driving test they have there, it's exactly the same every time. They say it, it, this corresponds to Taiwanese culture. It's completely fair. It's completely uh, uh, predictable, completely consistent. And it's completely detached from reality. That apparently, you know, it's like, yeah, it's this little miniature obstacle course. And you can be a terrible driver and just memorize exactly the sequence of steps you have to do um, to get through this obstacle course. And that's it, you know. Huh. So, yeah. Um, there I, definitely was a portion of that. I mean, it was yeah, yeah. over 10 years ago now that I took the test. But right. there was a portion that you would just go out and go on the road and go on the highway. When right. I so so not, not in Taiwan. No, oh, it's, okay. it's, a, it's an indoor closed track kind of thing. Yeah. So and in that way it did kind of test. Right, of course, but sure, sure, sure. To some extent, of course. I'm not yeah. saying there's zero, I'm also not saying there's zero relationship between how you do a driving test yeah. and how you and how you, how you you would do in real-world conditions. Actually, this does come back to what I'm saying about, about uh, IQ versus intelligence in a more meaningful sense, because yeah. that's especially gonna, gonna um, correspond at the low end of the scale. So, I mean, if you're actually blind, if you're actually visually impaired, if you actually have um, some kind of disorder that scatters your ability to focus and pay attention, and that shows up, that really impairs you doing the driving test. Someone at the extreme level, someone who's barely able to drive at all, sure, there's gonna be a strong correlation there between how you do on the test. But most of what we're interested in, most of what we're interested in, especially in social and political context, is at the high end of the test. I mean, nobody thinks Donald Trump is incapable of operating heavy machinery. Nobody is testing him in the same way. I mean, you know this more than most. A lot of the tests are calibrated, whether it's by psychiatrists or for the legal system, try to test someone, can they be legally responsible for their own financial affairs? Right. Uh, for example, an elderly person who's experiencing dementia, mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but even if it's a young person, you know, what mental age, is this person capable of consent and getting married contrary to their parents' wishes? Well, if they're judged to have a mental age of six years old, they're extremely severely retarded, you know, they may have a guardian who's able to make these decisions. Those things yeah. get, get disputed a lot. So there, there's one realm of intelligence tests that are really aimed at the low end of the spectrum. But almost, that's almost never what we're debating or discussing in these cases. What we're discussing instead is, and this is, this is where we get into multiple divisions between what's perceived as intelligent versus what's actually intelligent, and what's perceived as, uh, for example, good painting, as opposed to what's actually, in a sense, good painting. And for a painting to be a hit painting, like a song to be a hit song, doesn't mean it's an objectively good song. We just, we just live through. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> we just lived through Kanye West having a smash hit song that, you know, I think is objectively terrible. Yeah. Um, the point is also at any given point, a painting or a song or anything else can catch the, uh, catch the interest of the public or catch, it, catch the spirit of the moment and, uh, and be a hit. And that doesn't, does, first of all, doesn't reflect anything about the objective intrinsic quality of the, of the song or the painting. And it also doesn't tell you anything about the objective intelligence of the person who created it. I think all of us here are willing to admit right away, you could be quite stupid in many important ways and still be a, a brilliant painter, still produce aesthetically really uh, pleasing or important paintings. Um, now, likewise, we talk about intelligence and heredity of intelligence. Um, most of what's perceived as intelligence, and obviously I'm emphasizing that to some extent we don't know, or we, we, we ought to question, whether or not this really is intelligence. A lot of it is incredibly culturally conditioned. So what kind of intelligence did I inherit from my father? I want to give a quick disclaimer here. I think my, my father was not just very stupid, but really quite insane. 
But nevertheless, I was raised by my father, for example, to really value uh, the work of William Shakespeare, to think of seeing Shakespeare performed as an important part of life as a, as a young man, as, even as a child, and that reading Shakespeare was something really worthwhile and valuable. And I did. So this is not DNA, but this is a kind of cultural heredity. And I grew up in a culture in Toronto where, from an early age, I was perceived as intelligent for knowing a lot about Shakespeare. I mean, just compared to the average person, you know, that I knew these plays, I got these literary and cultural references and, and what have you. Now, is that intelligence? No. I mean, I think however you want to define real intelligence, these kinds of things right away absolutely challenge that perceived intelligence is going to have any meaningful connection to, to real intelligence. I mean, conversely, when you talk about any given test, a written format test, like the IQ test or the SAT test, um, if you study for and perform well on an organic chemistry test in the university, a written multiple choice test in organic chemistry, there's no doubt this is testing a certain kind of skill, dedication, motivation, self-discipline, memorization, et cetera, et cetera. But just as I'm uncomfortable in uh, pretending that my father raising me to value Shakespeare correlates to real intelligence in any meaningful sense, I'm, I'm even more skeptical that uh, becoming proficient in organic chemistry or pr proficient in the skills and knowledge you need to do really well on an SAT test is going to, uh, is, is going to in any way correspond to intelligence in a, in a meaningful sense. Hmm. So my walk of life, this is one of the things I said to TCAD, because he's, he's had a very different experience like me. I said, you know, I've known so many people. Yeah, we got to get to the gym. Um, I've known so many people who had PhDs uh, who were very proficient in writing tests and who were in a very meaningful sense stupid. I'm, we'd have to digress into examples and stories. But I've known some really, really stupid people who didn't just have high levels of formal education, but who had obviously excelled in the type of narrowly focused discipline you need to do well on college entrance exams, standardized tests and exams of different kinds at crucial, uh, crucial junctions of their lives. Yeah. So uh, maybe I am more skeptical than most or more hesitant than most to get on this bandwagon of pretending that what the IQ test proves or demonstrates is real intelligence. And uh, there's a little bit of a parallel here to the fact I always have to disclaim when I'm criticizing modes of activism and protest where I say, look, I'm not claiming this form of activism has zero efficacy um, handing out pamphlets. I'm not going to claim that there's zero effect of standing around the street corner handing out pamphlets. But I'm saying, look, let's talk about just how little the, the effectiveness is. There's something similar here where I have to disclaim um, I'm not claiming the IQ test is of zero uh, efficacy. Uh, I've already said I think it's very important to look at that when it's calibrated for degrees of retardation, degrees right. of mental disability. That's really important yeah. and worthwhile and worth talking about. Yeah, you yeah. know I have experience with that with my uh, one, one job that I had where I was working for a psychiatrist, or right. a psychologist, sorry. And he, uh, he did mental examinations on uh, people who were, they were trying to decide if they were uh, responsible, criminal responsibility evaluations, responsible right. for the crimes that they had committed. Um, if they were of the of the uh, level of intelligence that they were, could be held responsible for right. what they what they did. So yes, I, I do think in that way. Yeah, these, these tests are important to have. And uh, but yeah, I I agree with you. I mean, I and question it, right. like if somebody has uh, an extremely high IQ, where do the differences and what do the differences actually mean right. when they get to a certain point? You know, right. once you're past right. average or. You know. Well, right. I mean, something I think most of us know if we've written a lot of standardized tests you could have written the same standardized test two months apart and gotten a very different score. And that's mm -hmm. going to reflect how much studying you did and preparation you did and just the little things going on in your life. If any of us remember writing a big important test, oh, if I hadn't broken up with my girlfriend that month or if I hadn't gone out drinking, a few uh, incidental things. In the same way, one of the criticisms of the IQ test specifically is that when you look at the same person writing the test repeatedly over time, you get widely different, significantly different results oh, really? for the same person's yeah. alleged intelligence. So again, my point being, this isn't really showing you intelligence. It's just showing you how well this person can write this type of test or this, yeah. this particular test. So um, one of the ray of hope here, this came up a million years ago when we did the video together talking about uh, academically adrift. So that was a yeah. video criticizing what's going on in the university system. Now, one of the theories of education that's gaining steam right now in the 21st century uh, is called task-based learning. And I would point out that the flip side of that is ta task-based testing, 
where people are being tested by giving them a, a more analytical and creative task. So in that earlier video discussion, we talked about the fact that they decided to test the aptitude or acumen of these university students by giving them a series of short articles, for example, a series of contradictory short newspaper articles about um, a flaw in manufacturing airplanes. So, uh, short articles suggesting that there was something wrong with the engine and aircraft, it wasn't clear how reliable it was, and they'd read some different short articles from different perspectives, and then be given some very broad essay questions, not writing academic essays, but to synthesize and analyze the information and give recommendations about what should be done. And I've pointed to most of that, and I pointed out more recently also, that this is going to give you a very different measure of intelligence and of what intelligence is supposed to be. And that is the kind of intelligence we care about with Donald Trump. Mm. What we care about with Donald Trump or George W. Bush or Mao Zedong, can you sit down and read a series of short articles with mutually conflicting, mutually contradictory, biased or opinionated information and engage in some kind of analysis and engage in creative thinking and come to sober and insightful conclusions and write them up uh, clearly in your own first language, in this case, English. That, that is now, but again, uh, I'm biased. That is one test for one type of intelligence and that happens to be the type of intelligence I care about. I, I don't care so much about whether or not you can paint a beautiful painting. But if we had a painting-based test, if we had a purely creative, purely artistic test, that would doubtless measure intelligence and spawn a different set of measurements uh, in another way. So look guys, um, uh, as you guys know, I grew up uh, atheist, but in some sense Jewish, ethnically Jewish. Judaism is a whole subculture massively fueled by the idea of being born special, being born among the, the chosen people. And for me, the most dangerous and seductive element of this discourse about IQ and intelligence is the idea that you're born special, is that intelligence is something fixed from birth. And I think that any really sincere, thoroughgoing engagement with these issues is instead going to reveal what we call intelligence. It's not just that it's culturally conditioned. The example of my father encouraging me to read Shakespeare. It's not just a matter of perception versus reality. Um, the reality itself is something we really have to question. Any last words? <laughs> no, it's an interesting topic. I, I mean, I would like to revisit this topic again. We're not running out of tape. <laughs> That's the great thing about YouTube. The sequels never end. Yeah. Okay, let's hit the gym and get stupid. <laughs>